begin to shout because they felt sorry for the donkey. And they said, hey, old man, you and that little boy need to get off that donkey and leave him alone. He, does, he shouldn't have to carry you guys around. And the last time that, old, that frustrated old man was seen, he was carrying that donkey out of town. <laughs> and see, that's the way you can live your life, constantly listening to what the crowd says and making adjustments. But here's the thing, you're never going to please everybody. You're never going to make everybody happy. So you might as well stop listening to the crowd. And even at times, you have to quit hanging out the, with the wrong crowd. And I would rather have a first-rate version of you than a second-rate version of somebody else. But it's not what I want. It's what God wants. And I can tell you this. The Bible says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you very unique and very special. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you can be. He has this great plan for your life, and it's not based on what anybody else thinks or says about you. He would rather have a second-rate version of you than a first-rate version of somebody else. He'd even rather have a first-rate version of you than a second-rate version of somebody. He just wants you, right? But he'll never see you and never be able to work with you if you don't ever come apart from the crowd. The Bible is full of all of these uh, commands from God to come apart from crowds, to not be unequally yoked with the wrong people. There's lots of wisdom in God's Word about getting away from bad influences. So let me say it again. The big point was, you're not going to be what you decide to be. You're going to be what you decide to be around. And if you're not around the right people, you're not ar around the right influences, you're not going anywhere. See, when we try to please everybody else, we end up like the old man. We end up carrying a heavy burden that we should never have to carry because of public opinion. Do you realize what Hollywood and our culture has done to young ladies that think they, they, they have to be 18 years old and weigh 87 pounds? Because Hollywood or, or some magazine says this is what a woman has to look like. And it's a lie. It's, it's a lie straight from the pits of hell. You don't have to look like Hollywood says you have to look like. I mean, I'm glad you're not ugly. I don't like looking at ugly people. I like looking at pretty people and handsome young men, and I see that tonight. But even beyond the superficial, God is looking at your heart. He's not looking at the scales when you get on it and, and see what it says you weigh. God's not counting the pimples on your face. He's not even counting the gray hairs in my head to decide whether or not he loves me or he's going to work in my life or carry out the plan he has for my life. So don't listen to that. And that's the first thing I want you to do. The second thing I want to talk about tonight, of many things I want to talk about, but I'm going to respect the time, is something that's very near and dear to my heart is bullies. Because I have promised parents that I was going to talk about bullies uh, each and every time I had an opportunity to talk to young people. And this is what I want you to understand about bullies. Bullies thrive where authority is weak. Bullies thrive where authority is weak. And I wish they would let me come into the schools and talk about bullies because I was the victim of a bully when I was a little boy. And, you know, when I tell people that today, they're always amazed by it. I guess for, because I was in the Marine Corps and because I've been in law enforcement for 23 years, for some reason, people are just amazed when I tell them that I was pushed around and picked on as a little boy. And the fact is, you know, when I share my testimony with people, I, I tell them the reason I ended up in the Marine Corps was because of a bully. The reason I ended up in law enforcement was because of my experience with bullies. And, and here's the thing you have to understand about bullies. They, they thrive where authority is weak. And in other words, we can look at that in a very secular, physical way and say when teachers and principals and coaches aren't around, when the authority's not around, the bully picks on us because there's no authority there to control him. There's nobody there to tell him to stop or tell her to stop. Now, here's my concern about bullying. Did you know that one in four kids, one in four children, one in four teenagers, as they go through adolescence, are the victim of a bully? That means one in every four of you are going to be picked on and pushed around by somebody that's bigger than you or somebody you perceive as tougher than you or someone that you, you think you have to bow down to. And not only is one in four kids the victim of a bully, but 58% of them never even report it to anybody. And I'm going to tell you something. When I was being picked on in the fourth grade, I never dreamed of telling my mother what was going on. 
Never dreamed of it. And I, and I didn't even have a father, so who was I going to tell? Couldn't tell my dad. He wasn't there. And this kid, he, he pushed me around, he pushed me around, he pushed me around. There I was in fourth grade in Alderson Elementary School. And this, this guy that was a lot bigger than me, in fact, I was in fourth grade and he had a mustache. See, he had been held back a few years. I mean, I could handle my own with my fellow fourth graders. But, you know, for some reason, they put me in a fourth grade class in Alderson Elementary School with Jethro Bodine. And there I was being picked on. And back then, we had this... This action figure, he, he was called Big Jim. How many of you old people remember Big Jim? I had a couple Big Jims and all kinds of stuff. I had a G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip. I had a Stretch Armstrong. Anybody remember Stretch Armstrong? And I had something else that was really cool. I had the $6 million man. And I could hold him up and look through the little hole in the back of his head. And he had a little telescope in his eye. And I could roll up. Y'all remember that? He had these flesh-toned skin, but you could roll his skin up and you see all the wires and the stuff because he had a bionic arm and bionic legs and all. Man, I had to give all of that stuff to the bully because every time I went to school, he'd say, I want something else. I want your big gym. I want your G.I. Joe. I want your Stretch Armstrong. And the next thing you know, my toy box was empty. Man, I, I started looking for other people's stuff to steal to give to him to keep this guy off of me. And the only way this bully was ever exposed, it was like this. He wrote me a note one day of, of all the things he was going to do to me. He was going to pulverize me. He was going to knock my two front teeth out. He was going to stomp me with his big old boots. I mean, he was going to do all these things to me. And I folded, and, and of course, you know, the conditions of my surrender were outlined in this note, the things I had to bring. And I didn't know what I was going to do. But, you know, my mom did my laundry. And she found my little Lee jeans with a little note in the pocket. And what you have to understand is long before this, I was missing a lot of school. I had a lot of make-believe belly aches. I'd get up in the morning, oh, I'm so sick, I'm so sick. And I believe my mom began to question her cooking ability. You know, she's getting the water tested in the well and having people come in and test for radon because she thought her son was dying. I, I, I mean, I would miss school like crazy. And, and she was taking me to the doctor, and, you know, I was wanting to sit down with the doctor and say, look, there's nothing wrong with me, but let's keep this between us. Can I get a note? You know, whatever it took. I just didn't want to go to school and face this guy. And she found that note, and she come in, and I, she made me sit down on that bottom bunk bed. My brother and I had bunk beds. And she said, I have found this. I know now why you're missing school. We are going to the school tomorrow. We are going to handle this. And I just thought, oh, the only thing worse than getting beat up by a bully is showing up at school with your mom to talk about the bully. But that's what she did. There was no talking her out of it. And so we went to school the next day. They brought him in the office. And the whole time he's looking at me like he's going to kill me. He was, much bigger. he was a foot and a half taller than me. And we went in, and, and the principal was there, and, and, and uh, his parole officer was there with him. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the guard from the prison, that he was, work, he was on school release, not work release. And, and anyway, you know, we had this big powwow there, and they're like, you'll never bother him again, and make prom you apologize to him. And, prom and he's, he's sitting there, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you're going to be sorry. I could just, I could feel it. I could look at it. And you know what? After that meeting was over, I had two weeks of peace. My stomach didn't hurt. I didn't want to miss school. I started doing what I was supposed to at school for about two weeks, about two full work school weeks. I, I'll never forget it, right there at Allerson Elementary School. And after about two weeks, the big talk in the office wore off. All the eyes, all the focus was off of the situation. And the next thing you know, I found myself out there on the playground, and there he was again. And he started pushing me around, and he started pushing me around, and he started pushing me around. And that actually went on. I'd love to tell you that I just handled it right there. But you know what? It went on for a couple months because that was right there uh, just past the halfway point in the school year. And the next thing you know, he was just pushing me around. I went right back. I didn't miss school. I just kept waiting to take the beating. I just kept waiting. But you know what? The beating never came. And I was out on the playground. It was near the end of the school year. I'll never forget. It was a beautiful day. And I, I can recall how green 
and beautiful the grass was out on the, the playground because the playground was the football field between the elementary school and the middle school. And I was out there, and I was making my move on this girl that I really liked because I've always been pretty suave, even in fourth grade. And this bully, you know, somebody, I'm not going to say his name, but somebody said his name, and they said, there he comes. And I turned and looked and saw him, and when I turned back around, all my friends were gone. And that'd be nice if you and all your friends would just handle the bully, right? Because there's strength in numbers. But, you know, cowardice is also contagious. <laughs> and <laughs> the Bible says I'd rather be a live dog than a dead lion. And I guess those kids had learned that in Sunday school that Sunday. And so they fled with the dogs, and there I was, the lone lion. And I'll never forget just turning around, looking at him, and thinking, nah, not anymore, not anymore. And he came up to me, and before he ever got his hand up, because he was going to push me, I went crazy. I went berserk. And I've always said this, the spring in me sprung. And there's a reason that I remember how plush and green the grass was, because it wasn't, but a few seconds later, I was rolling around in it. And I was beating down on this guy. And he had grass and dirt in his teeth and things like that. And I was just hitting him. And the next thing you know, you know, the, the, the teachers are over there pulling me off of him. And, you know, the teachers weren't saying you shouldn't have done that because they, they knew. They knew. And, you know, after that day, he never bothered me again. He never bothered me again. But here's the thing I want you to understand. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm really not. Because I can't tell you to do that. Because it's between you and your parents and the school. But if it's me, I'd just beat the daylights out of them, okay? No, I'm just... <laughs> yeah, you can tell them I said to do it. I will be your attorney in court. Here's the thing. If you are the victim of a bully or you've been the victim of a bully, but especially if you are now, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I love to tell this to people. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. But sometimes you're the one who has to reach over and turn the switch on. And you might even have to change a couple bulbs. But the light will come on again. But you have to handle it. You can't just continue to be pushed around. You cannot continue to be intimidated. You're, have to go, you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to fight back. You're going to have to talk to your parents about it or your guardian. You're going to have to go to somebody at the school about it. But the one thing you can't do is do nothing. You cannot do nothing. Now, in the Bible, we can go, go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 11, and the Bible says this, Nahash the Ammonite, he came out against the men at Jabesh Gilead, and he laid siege on them. And you know what the men at Jabesh said? When Nahash came out, now it's important that you realize this, the name Nahash means serpent. Or snake. Bullies are snakes. Bullies are serpents. And I know how to handle them. The men at Jabesh said this. When they saw those bullies coming, when they saw Nahash and his army coming, they immediately begin to bow and say, Hey, let's make a treaty. Let's make peace. Let's make an agreement that you won't pick on us. It's in the Bible. It really is. First Samuel chapter 11. And you know what Nahash said? Nahash says this. He says, we won't pick on you. We won't push you around. We're not going to beat you up on one condition. You let us gouge out your right eye so that it will be an embarrassment upon you and your people. Can you imagine somebody coming to you and saying, look, you know, I'm not going to pick on you. I'm not going to beat you up. I'm not going to kill you, whatever, as long as you let me take this knife and dig your eye out of your head. How many of you are going to agree to that? <laughs> Nobody, I would hope. But you know what these guys said? They said, well, give us seven days to think about it. That's how cowardly they were. Nobody was reaching for the light switch. Nobody was changing the bulbs. Nobody saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And if there was one, they were going to be looking at it with one eye in about seven days. I only see half the light. <laughs> but something incredible happened. While these men were cowards, and they began to talk amongst themselves, well, it would be better to have one eye than be dead. 
It better to be have it'd be better to have one eye than be a slave. It would be better to have just one eye than to be beat up by these guys. But there was a man named Saul that heard about this because all the people in that region began to cry and carry on because nobody was talking about fighting. Everybody was just crying and carrying on. And Saul comes down from work in the fields and he's like, What in the world is going on? Why is everybody crying? And they're like, Oh, Saul, haven't you heard? Man, Nahash has come down with his big army, and they're telling the men down at Jabesh that, that they're going to have to give up their right eye. They're going to dig their right eye out of their head if they don't completely surrender and bow down. And even if they agree to that, they're going to have to give up their eye or defend themselves. And Saul's like, well, what the problem is? Why, why are we not rallying the troops right now? And, and people are like, well, uh, you know, see, that's the problem. A lot of people are just submissive right away. No, nobody has the spirit to fight to stand up to that. And Saul, you know what Saul did? Saul didn't cre put, you know, he didn't make a bunch of posters and say, we want you to join our army. He didn't say that at all. You seen Uncle Sam on that poster? We want you. He didn't go make commercials and say, you know, join the army, be all you can be. He didn't do that. He, did, he didn't do like the Marine Corps and say, hey, we're looking for a few good men. He, he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't do like the Air Force and say, hey, aim high. Come be a fly boy. He didn't do any of that. He didn't start singing uh, the village people's version of in the Navy. How many of you old people remember that? I know you remember YMCA. Okay. You remember in the Navy. He didn't do anything. You know what he did? He went and got an ox. And he pulled out his sword. And he... Hacked that ox into pieces. And he took him big chunks of oxen meat. And he didn't put them on the grill. He put them on the back of chariots. And he sent those men in those chariots out to the different regions around Jabesh, down to Bezek. He sent them out and he said, you tell the people this. Look at that big piece of dead oxen flesh and meat on the back of this chariot. And if you don't come down here and join the army, this is going to happen to all your oxen. If you don't come down here and join the army that's going to go down there and defend those men at Jabesh Gilead, if you don't come and join this army, this is going to happen to your stuff. We're going to come and get Fido and Rufus and Spot and Bubbles. I mean... Put that in terms today we can understand. You know, you got a big dog and somebody hacks the dog up and says, Hey, you see this piece of dog meat right here? That's what we're going to do to your dogs if you don't come down here and join us. And don't you know, everybody come out and said, Hey, I've always been wanting to serve in the army. Now would be a good time. And they came out and there were 330,000 of them that came out. And you know what? As they were getting their forces together... They sent a messenger down to the men at Jabesh Gilead, and they said this. They said, you, hey, here's the message. By the time the sun gets hot tomorrow, we're going to be there to save you. We're going to bail you out. And so they told Nahash, they said, you know what? We've decided to surrender. We've decided to give, out, give up our right eye. We'll meet you down there in the valley tomorrow when the sun's at its highest point. Because, see, we want you to be able to see real good when you start to dig the eye out of our head. I mean, they were going to make eyeball soup and eyeball stew that evening. That's what they were going to have. And so all these men at Jabesh, they went down there. And when that sun was at its highest part, and Nahash and his army came down there and met those few men, those men of Jabesh, Gilead, they were getting ready to dig their eyes out. And those men at Jabesh said, Skirt! We're going to put a zig on the zag and a flip on the flop. We've changed our mind. And Nahash says, you ain't changing your mind. And the men at Jabesh said, you better look around at the hills. And when Nahash looked up, there were 330,000 men had surrounded them. And the men at Jabesh just backed out. And Nahash and his army was destroyed on that day. You see, help comes. It comes at the right time. And God wants to help you. And he will. But sometimes you're the one that has to flip on the switch. Sometimes you're the one that has to change the bulb. Now, here's the thing. Here's the third thing I want to say to you. See, I talked about the crowd, which I talk about the crowd because you're so sick of hearing about peer pressure. But that's really what it is, peer pressure. And the other thing you're dealing with are these bulbs.